Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in this afternoon, and I think even our TV audience will realize this is the biggest crowd we've had yet, so uh, we appreciate that all of you have come in, and as we uh, found out before we came on the air, we've got people from all over the country here today. I haven't got time to list all the states, but wherever you're from today, we just appreciate the fact that you're here with us. All right, we're going to finish where we left off in our last taping, and I didn't quite end up the way I wanted to, and uh, we're going to go back and finish that today. With, so if you'll join me here in the studio, and for those of you out in television, we're going to go back to Dan Daniel chapter 12, and we're going to finish that last three or four verses dealing with the resurrection of the Old Testament and the tribulation saints. Beginning at Daniel chapter 12, verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. In other words, just like now, even as it comes toward the end of the tribulation, there will be those that will still be hearing the kingdom gospel, perhaps from the 144,000, and will become believers, be martyred for it, of course. But on the other hand, the vast majority of the human race that's still surviving will never turn from their wickedness. All right, reading up. In verse 10, none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall. Now here's the timing, and this is what I want to deal with today, because so many, even the people that I read, ha have just got this all befuddled, or they ignore it completely, and we're just going to look at it for what it says, that from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, which will be in the midpoint of those seven years, from the midpoint of those seven years, and the abomination that maketh desolate is set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, to take us to the end of seven years, or the final three and a half, it should be twelve hundred and sixty. But we've got an extra thirty days tacked on. Now you come down into verse twelve. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days or a total of an extra 75 days. And then verse 13 is the key to the whole thing. But God says to the prophet Daniel, go thy way until the end be. Now you've got to go back several verses. I think it's here in chapter, chapter 12. Yeah, just go back to verse 8, and then you'll see why Daniel is addressed the way he is. Back here in chapter 12, verse 8, Daniel says, I heard, but I understood not. In other words, all the things concerning these end time events. And I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Well, he was human. He was just like we are. Well, you know, you just want to know what, what, what's coming next, see? And so what does the Lord tell him? Just be patient. Shut up the book because you're not going to be concerned with it until the end anyway. All right, so he says in verse 9, then Daniel, the words are closed up, and they're sealed until the time of the end. All right, so now then, you come down to verse 13. I hope I haven't confused you. So now then, Daniel is told that he's not to be concerned with these hundreds, and now another 2,000. So we're about 2,600 years beyond the time that Daniel is living. And he is just simply told to just rest and go in thy own way, and you will stand in your lot at the end of the days. Well, what days? These 1,200 and uh, extra 75 days. So here we have the end time scenario after the tribulation has ended and Christ is returned and the earth has already been made beautiful like the Garden of Eden. Now, I got to constantly remind people, the Lord himself said it, with God, nothing is what? Impossible. So when we see a devastated planet as a result of the nuclear explosions that we've been explaining the last several programs, don't think it's impossible for God to reestablish a beautiful surface of the planet in an instant. 
But you see, we are so human, we think, well, that can't happen. Well, all I can suggest to people is on a beautiful starlight night, before the full moon knocks all the light out, on a beautiful starlight night, just consider what little bit of the universe we can see. And it's only a little infinitesimal part of all. And yet, those trillions of stars are all under God's thumb. He knows every one of them. He knows exactly where they are. Well, then I have to make the parallel. If he knows all those trillions of objects in space, you think he's going to have any trouble with a few million or billion human beings on the planet? No, no, not at all. So never limit God. He is so far beyond this. And that's why we have to take it by faith. All right, so here he has devastated the planet with all the nukes and everything that's going to total destroy everything. And yet, almost as instantly, this planet is going to be as beautiful as it was in the Garden of Eden for the onset of that thousand-year earthly kingdom. That's the way it's going to happen. All right, and so after the 75 days have run their course, from the second coming, he sets up the kingdom, and then will come the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, or the believers. Now, I'm betwixt and between where to go first, and uh, here's where I always ask the Spirit to lead. So let's go back to Matthew a minute, and we'll just put Daniel on hold and come all the way up to Matthew chapter 27. Now what I'm going to do in order to clarify these, these various resurrections, and you've got to remember that, and I think I stressed it on the program just either the other morning or today, I don't know, but I know I, re I, I made reference to it, that the resurrection does not just merely mean to be dead and brought back to life like uh, Elijah did with the widow's son or like Jesus did with Lazarus. That was not resurrection. That was just returning them back to life. They died again. But at resurrection, people who have lived and died will be, as believers now, will be brought back to life eternal with a body fit for eternity. All right, now we're going to go back, and I think we did this in a previous program. We're going to look at a little field of grain in Israel. Uh, here in America, we're so acquainted with 40 acres, so you can look at it in that light. All right, now we're going to go back and check out the scripture for all this, but you see, when the Jews were getting ready for the Feast of first fruits, it was in the spring, and barley was their number one early spring crop. Now, those of you here in Oklahoma, with all of our wheat and so forth, you, you certainly are aware that as that green field of wheat begins to turn color, gradually gets a little bit more yellow and gold, then all of a sudden, sprinkled throughout the field, what do you see? Some early ripening single stems of rain, grain. Just one stem here and a stem there, and the heads on that are gold and yellow. Well, then about two, three days later, the rest of the crop catches up. All right, now what Israel was to do with their barley harvest was as soon as those early little individual stems of grain were ripe, they were to go into their barley field, pluck those individual stems until they had enough to make a sheaf or a bundle. All right, then what did they do with it? They took it up to the temple, and it was a wave offering. And that was just the instruction. Now, we're going to go back and look at it in just a moment. All right, now then, after they had plucked out those early stems of ripened grain, then naturally what followed? Well, the main harvest. Now, I'm going to use the analogy of the grain harvest with the resurrections because the Lord himself associated soul winning with harvesting. You all know the verse. For the fields are what? White unto harvest. Well, it was a spiritual harvest, see? All right, so the same way here. I'm going to use the analogy now that as Israel was to go into the approaching harvest of their early spring barley field, they would go in and pluck out those early uh, ripening grain, make a wave offering. Then they'd come in and take the crop. 
naturally. That's the whole idea is to get the crop. But they were instructed not to harvest the corners or the gleanings. Now, you know what gleanings are. Those are the stems that didn't get picked up, whether it's today's big machinery or whether it was back in antiquity when they used the little hand side. So what was the purpose? Well, for the poor. So what we're going to do is take these three segments of the harvest and associate it spiritually. The first fruits, the main harvest, and then the corners and the gleanings. All right, let's start with the first fruits. That's in Matthew 27. Now, I'm doing all this to get ready for Daniel's waiting at the end of the 75 days. Matthew chapter 27, and come over to verse 51. And it's the account at the time of the crucifixion. Beginning at verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom. Now, you all know what the veil was. That was that heavy cloth curtain between the main part of the, of the temple, or the tabernacle, in which was the candlestick and the, the, uh, the loaves of showbread and the altar of incense. And then behind the veil was the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant. All right, that veil split, of course, from top to the bottom, indicating now that the way into the holiest of all was accessible without using the high priest. But who knows, what did Israel do with the veil? They sewed it back up. And they kept right on with their temple worship, never catching on what God had already said. See, I mean, that's the human race for you. That question comes in every once in a while. Well, what happened to the veil when it was split in two? They sewed it back up and continued on with temple worship until the Romans destroyed it. All right, but now back to the text. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks rent. Now verse 52. And the graves were opened. It doesn't say how many, but again, it's just a sampling. The graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints, that is, these believing Jews who had died, arose. Now, you know, I'll never forget these three verses. I hadn't been in Oklahoma but a month or two, and a good old deacon from one of the low one of the local churches collared me, and he said, Les, he said, what are these people who came out of the graves while Christ was on the cross? I said, I never heard of such a thing. Oh, yeah. He said, they came out of the grave while Christ was on the cross. I said, well, now let's just go look a minute. That doesn't sound right. Now, you've got to remember, I wasn't as advanced in my Bible knowledge as I am now, but I knew it was something wrong. So I went and looked at it, you know, just like everybody else, what did he not see? The next verse. People don't read. Look at the next verse. And they came out of the graves after his resurrection, not while he was on the cross. See how easy it is to just goof everything up? In fact, somebody just showed me a letter to the editor of one of our more famous magazines in the country, and they were referring to me, no doubt about it, and they had totally, totally misquoted me, as misquoted as a man could be, and then the editor comments on my misquote. See, and then that's when I get uptight. I mean, if they want to comment on what I've said, then they ought to check me out on the internet and so forth. But no, they don't do that. They just say, well, this guy's a false teacher. Don't listen to him. Well, no wonder I'm false if I'm misquoted. How else can you be? All right, so here again, see how easy it is for people to misread? He thought this happened while Christ was on the cross. No, they didn't come out of their graves until after his resurrection. Now, why am I emphasizing the after? Because Christ had to be the first to ever be resurrected from the dead. And as I pointed out in one of my recent programs on your daily, Monday through Friday, I was referring to the only begotten of the Father. Maybe some of you heard it in the last morning or two. 
Well, what does it mean that Christ was the only begotten of the Father? Well, the average church member says, well, that's Bethlehem. No, that's not Bethlehem. When he became the only begotten Son of God, that was at his resurrection. Now, I guess I better use the scripture because uh, I got time enough. Come back with me to Psalms. You know, this is what I tell people at my seminars, you know, we know more and get started than we start going all over the book. Well, that's the way I teach. I can't help that. So now today we're going to do the same thing. Come back with me to Psalms chapter 2, where you have that only begotten Son of God mentioned for the first time. Clear back in Psalms. Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. Psalms 2, verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day I have begotten thee. Well, what day is he speaking of? Well, now again, we've got to compare Scripture with Scripture to get our answers. Now come up with me to the book of Acts. Chapter 13. And Paul is speaking in Antioch of Pisidia. That's up there in central Turkey. Come back with me to Acts chapter 13. And uh, he's rehearsing all this before the Jews in that particular synagogue. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to take the time. I didn't plan to do this, but let's just take the time so that we qualify what it means that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Let's go all the way up to verse 26. And we may just skim some of these things for sake of time. But here Paul is addressing this whole scenario to these Jews in the synagogue. And he says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not. Now this goes back to his earthly ministry, remember. They knew him not, nor yet even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. All right, though they found no cause of death in him, yet they desired Pilate that he should be slain. Verse 29, and when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. Now this has been unheard of up until this time, see? God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. Verse 33, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is, now watch this. This is what you have to do with Scripture now. As it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Well, now the next verse. As concerning that, the quote from Psalms 2. Concerning that, being called the only begotten Son of God, he raised him up from the dead. Now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. All right, so what caused God to call him the only begotten Son? His resurrection. All right, now let's just go to one more. Go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 1. And see, here's where there is so much ignorance in Christendom. They don't take the time to check these things out. Where did the term originate? Well, it originated in Psalms chapter 2. Paul explains it in Acts 13, but now here comes the frosting on the cake. Romans 1, starting at verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scripture, 
Now verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. In other words, his lineage fleshly came from King David. And now look at verse 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by what great act? The resurrection from the dead. And see, the resurrection is almost totally ignored today. They can talk about taking Jesus into your heart. He's died for your sins, but they're leaving out the power because the power was not exercised until he rose from the dead. You with me? Now, that's the only begotten part of the Son of God, that he was raised from the dead. All right, now then, let's come back again quickly to Matthew 27. I don't think I finished here anyway. And so they came out of the graves after his resurrection because he had to be the first to be resurrected and to be declared the only begotten Son of God. All right, now then, reading on in Matthew 27, verse 53, they came out of the graves after his resurrection, went into the holy city. Well, now remember, these are believing Jews who had died, and like we've always taught, the soul and spirit went for the Old Testament saint down to paradise. But you see, now in this case, they come out of the graves and receive not just the resurrected soul and, and spirit, but the body. And so they walk into the streets of Jerusalem in the new resurrected body. Now, it goes to common sense then that they went only long enough to prove resurrection and that they were the sampling of the first fruits that we saw in the barley field in the realm of the spiritual. I think that's the whole purpose, so that they could fulfill the role of the first fruits, and then they went on up into glory, because there's no record of Jews still living today that were on the streets in 2000, or in uh, zero, 2000 years later. So we have to assume that they went on up in to glory in those resurrected bodies. All right, now let's come back then again to Leviticus chapter 23 and pick up where all of this actually began. And it's right back here in the early days of Israel's temple worship when they're still out in the desert and they have the little tabernacle tent. And now you get into chapter 23 and you have the feast days of Israel. <coughs> All got it? Leviticus 23, and let's just start at verse 9. Leviticus chapter 23, starting at verse 9. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, you shall reap the harvest thereof. Now, like I said, the earliest grain was barley. So when you reap the barley harvest, <clears throat> then you shall bring a sheaf, or I call them bundles, of the first fruits of your harvest, those earliest ripening stems of grain, the sample, see? And you will bring the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you, for on the morrow after the Sabbath shall the priest wave it. All right, so that was the first step of fulfilling these resurrections. The first fruits, which was Christ, and these samplings that came out of the graves at Jerusalem. All right, now if you'll back up a few pages in Leviticus to chapter 19, we see the next part that they have to obey with regard to harvest is in verse 9. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9. Leviticus 19, verse 9. Now, these were all instructions according to the law. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly or completely reap the corners, so you leave them, 
neither shall you gather the gleanings. And the reason? For the poor. So God provides for the whole set of society. And so the poor were dealt with by leaving the corners and the gleanings. In other words, they would be the picture of the very last of the resurrections. All right, now I haven't really got time enough to go into the next segment, but uh, let's come back and stop at Daniel chapter 12 a minute before we go on to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you'll stop at Daniel 12 as you go on up through now, and just to refresh our memory, because I've got to remember, you know, attention span isn't all that long even for adults. We know it's not long for kids, but adults aren't much better. Daniel chapter 12 again, the very last verse, verse 13. And remember, Daniel is curious. What in the world is the meaning of all this? And God just says it's not for you to know because it was so out, far out in the future, he wouldn't have any contact with it anyway. All right, but here's what he says then. Verse 13, <clears throat> go thy way until the end be. Then he would be part of it. For thou shalt rest. Well, what does that mean? In death. See? His body would be asleep in the ground, and his soul and spirit would be in the presence of the Lord. For thou shalt rest, and then here's his end. And thou shalt stand in thy lot. Now, just like the word company is in 1 Corinthians, it's a military term. It was a, a, a term of organization. Now, I think all of you are aware, aware of military chain of command. When you're down here as a foot soldier and a private, you're in a company. And then when you move up in organization, the next one is, if I remember right, battalion. And if a battalion, you come to a regiment, regiment to the division, see? All right, those are all military terms. So if you write a letter to a serviceman, you have to know what part of the organization he's in or he'll never get his mail. And so it's the same way in Scripture. We're using here military terms of organization. So Daniel is told to wait in his particular lot, whether it was a company or a battalion or whatever, but God knew. Well, Paul is going to use the same thing, only in the Greek, and it's going to be a little different term, but it also is a term of organization. God is an organizer. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felt.